band B, you saw how to describe fields using coordinate systems. Now we're going to put that to work. Vector calculus is a branch of mathematics which gives us a powerful tool for investigating the properties of fields. The most important operations in vector calculus are known as grad, div, and curl. Taking the gradient, or grad, of a scalar field results in a new field, a vector field. The divergence, or div, of a vector field is a scalar field. And taking the curl of a vector field gives rise to another vector field. In bands C and D, we're going to look at each of these operations in turn. We're not going to go through the formal mathematics in detail. That's set out in the unit. Instead, we want to give you some feel for the physical interpretation of these things. Let's start with gradient or grad. It's related to the familiar concept of slope. Here's a model of a hill standing in the xy plane. The height of the hill at any point is just a scalar quantity, so many meters. So the height, as a function of position in the xy plane, is a scalar field. A two-dimensional scalar field because it's a function of just two variables, x and y. Now, if I place a ball on the hillside and let go, it will roll down the direction of steepest downward slope, which is at right angles to the contour line. So, at any point x, y, we have a direction. And there's a magnitude, too, because the ball starts to roll faster here than it does here. A magnitude and a direction at all points. Well, the ball rolls down the slope, but in fact, the gradient vector grad is in the opposite direction in the direction of increasing values of the scalar field. And the magnitude is the rate of change of the scalar field in that direction. And so we have a gradient vector at every point. That's a vector field, which we can represent with arrows like this. We think of the arrows as lying in the plane where the field is defined, the xy plane. Well, those were two-dimensional fields, but grad is an operator which can be applied to any scalar field. Take our example of the temperature in this room. That's a three-dimensional field given by T equals T naught plus KZ. Here, the contours are surfaces parallel to the XY plane. Although we often have to deal with three-dimensional fields, it's easier to see what's happening by just looking at a two-dimensional section. So let's take a vertical section. Now, the contours are horizontal lines. The temperature T increases in the Z direction, and the rate of change, dT by dZ, is K, a constant. So in this case, the gradient vector, grad T, is equal to K times EZ. That's a constant vector field, which we can represent at each point by an arrow. Here are some of them. They all have the same length and the same direction. We can also represent vector fields by field lines. For a constant vector field in the z direction, like this one, the field lines look like this. You'll hear more about field lines in just a moment. Now let's move on to divergence. This time, we're going to start with a vector field, f, and from it derive a scalar field called the divergence of f, or div f. Now, the concept of divergence is based on the idea of the flux of a vector field through a surface. Flux is this surface integral, but we can think of it in terms of field lines. The flux of a vector field through a surface is proportional to the number of field lines passing through the surface. Proportional because the actual number of field lines is always arbitrary. So. If we have a closed surface, then the flux passing out through the surface is proportional to the number of field lines coming out of it. And that idea leads straight away to the concept of divergence. We'll illustrate it using a constant three-dimensional vector field. 
which we're showing in section. We can represent the field by a set of equally spaced parallel field lines. It's the equal spacing of the field lines which tells us that the field is uniform and the arrows indicate the direction. Although only a finite number of lines can be shown, the field exists uniformly everywhere in the region. Now the divergence at a point in the field is defined like this. We take a closed surface completely surrounding the point and then closing a volume delta V. Here's a section of it. We measure the flux passing outwards through the surface. We divide by the volume delta V and take the limit as the volume shrinks to zero. Now in this region, we can decide straight away that the divergence must be zero because the lines are continuous. There are no field lines beginning or ending in the region. So, wherever we put our small volume, the number of lines entering on one side is equal to the number of lines leaving it on the other side. So the net flux passing out through the surface is always zero. And that remains true however small delta V becomes. The net flux per unit volume which emerges from it has to be zero. Here's a different field. We've shown just a selection of the vectors in the region. Although it's always in the same direction, this field increases steadily in magnitude as we move from the left to the right of the region. So how do you think we could represent this field using field lines? Stop the tape and sketch a field line representation for this field. The vector field is everywhere directed from left to right, and so the field lines must be parallel horizontal lines everywhere. Because the vector field increases in magnitude, we must show field lines starting at various points in the region. Now there's nothing special about the particular points where the field lines start, but the discrete nature of the field line representation means that we have to start them somewhere. Now, if we take our small volume delta V, here's a section of it, we can see that there are more field lines, that is, more flux, leaving the volume than entering it, because there are field lines starting inside the volume. So there's a net flux emerging from the volume, and that will give us a positive divergence. And if our picture could show enough field lines, you would see that in the limit, as delta V goes to zero, the net flux emerging from the volume, divided by the volume, would remain finite. And so we'd get a positive divergence at every point in the region. We'll look at a real example of this in a moment. But first, let's look at another example of a non-uniform vector field. This time, it's a three-dimensional radial field seen as a two-dimensional section. As in the first example, the field lines are continuous, though this time they're not parallel. This field gets weaker as we move upwards. But no field lines begin or end in the region shown. And so the net flux leaving any small volume in the region is zero. You can easily see that for this volume any field line that enters at the bottom must come out at the top. And that's true for any shape of volume. What goes in must come out somewhere, no more and no less. And this remains true whatever the size and shape of the volume delta V. So the divergence is always zero. But what happens further down? The field lines all emanate from this central point. So now, if we put our small volume at this central point, there is a net flux passing out through the surface, which is proportional to the total number of field lines. And this flux remains the same however small we make the volume, so long as it encloses the central point. So we have a divergence at that point. In fact, the divergence is infinite here because, in the definition, we divide the flux by the volume delta V, and in the limit, the quotient becomes infinite. <laughs>
We'll face the problem of an infinite divergence in just a moment, but let's now summarize the main points. Given a vector field f, we can derive a scalar field called the divergence of f, or div f. If the field lines of f are continuous in a region, the divergence div f is zero in that region. The divergence is non-zero only in regions where field lines start or end. Let's look at a real example now. This is one of the examples from band B, the radiation field from the sun. And it's another example of a radial field. First of all, we'll simply consider the sun to be a point source of light, just as the distant stars appear to us. Suppose that the sun emits a total energy of x joules every second, so that x is the total power. The radiation flows radially away from the sun in all directions. And the radiation flow is spherically symmetric. Now the vector field we're interested in here is the energy flow rate per unit area. We'll call it the radiation flow vector N of R. And it's measured in watts per square meter. We're using spherical polar coordinates because the system is spherically symmetric. So what's the value of N at some distance R from the sun? Well, since the sun is emitting at x joules per second, and we know that all that energy must pass through a spherical surface centered on the sun, then the energy flow per unit area at R is just x divided by the surface area of the sphere for pi R squared. And it points in the direction of the radial unit vector ER. So we have N of R equals x over 4 pi R squared times ER. Because this vector field has an inverse square law dependence on distance, we can represent it by a set of continuous field lines like this. Remember, the strength of a field is proportional to the density of the field lines, that is, to the number passing through a unit area. And for the continuous field lines here, that number is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. All the field lines start on the sun. There are no field lines starting anywhere else. So this radiation field has zero divergence everywhere except exactly at the sun, where in this case the divergence is infinite since we're considering the sun to be a point source. But of course, the sun isn't a point, so let's look at it more closely. Within the body of the sun, power is generated by nuclear reactions. If we take a small volume well within the body of the sun, and measure the flux of the radiation flow outwards through the surface of the volume, then we'll find that there's a net outflow. And this leads to a finite positive divergence. Now, the net amount of flux leaving the small volume will obviously be related to the power generated by the material inside the volume. We might call it the source strength. And the divergence, which is just the flux per unit volume, is related to the source strength per unit volume. This radiation source strength per unit volume is a scalar quantity, which varies from place to place within the sun. It's a scalar field. And so we can think of the divergence of a vector field as a source strength per unit volume. Inside the sun, where the energy is generated, the divergence is positive. Field lines begin here. Outside the sun, there are no sources. The divergence is zero, and the field lines are continuous. Now, some stars are surrounded by a cloud of gas and dust called a nebula, which absorbs some of the radiation emitted by the star. The cloud acts as a sink of radiation. This is a picture of the Helix Nebula. The nebula is this almost spherical cloud of gas and dust surrounding the central star, which you can see as a small bright spot. Eventually, the nebula will condense into a planetary system, but in the meantime, it acts as a weakly absorbing shell around the star. Inside the star, energy is generated by nuclear fusion, as in the case of the sun. Each small volume is a source of radiation, which then propagates through the outer layers of the star, through the empty space between the star and the nebula, then through the absorbing medium of the nebula, and finally out through empty space to you and me. In the video notes, 
you're given a formula for the radiation flow field in this system and a rule for calculating the divergence of the field by differentiation. So you should be able to calculate the divergence in the various regions of this system and you'll see how divergence is related to the source or sink strength in the region. You've seen that the divergence of a vector field is a scalar field and that it's related to the sources and sinks of the vector field. We can relate this to what you already know about electric and magnetic fields from your prerequisite physics course. The field lines of an electrostatic field always begin on positive charges and end on negative charges. So the electric charges are sources and sinks of the field and the divergence of the field is positive in a region of positive charges and negative in a region of negative charges. In between charges, the field lines are continuous and the divergence of the electrostatic field is zero. But there are other fields in electromagnetism where the field lines are always continuous. What does that imply about the divergence of these fields? Well, it must mean that the divergence is always zero. To see how that can happen, think of a magnetic field B around a long straight wire which is carrying a current. The magnetic field lines are concentric circles around the wire. Let's look at a cross section through the wire. Then the field lines would look like this. Since the field lines are complete circles, they have no beginning and no end. So the divergence of the magnetic field is always zero. But what about within the wire? The current is flowing within the wire, and it's the current that causes the magnetic field. But the field lines are still circles, even within the wire. The magnitude of the magnetic field increases from zero at the center to a maximum at the surface of the wire but its divergence is always zero inside the wire as well as outside. Magnetic fields are always associated with currents, but the field lines always form closed loops with no beginning or end, so the divergence of B is always zero. So you've seen that electrostatic fields have sources and sinks where electric charges are located and the divergence of the field is non-zero. Magnetic fields certainly have sources, namely the electric currents that generate them. But magnetic fields always have zero divergence. But there's no contradiction here. Divergence is a scalar, but the source of a magnetic field is a vector, not a scalar. The current in this wire has a direction as well as a magnitude. If you change the direction of the current, the magnetic field will change too. Well, in fact, there is a vector field which can be derived from the magnetic field by a process known as taking the curl of the magnetic field. And it's this vector field, curl B, that's related to the electric currents. Curl is the subject of the next band of this tape, and you'll be advised when to watch it at the appropriate point in the unit.